Good morning. Man, that was kind of weak. Good morning. Yeah, everybody's oh, Good to see y'all this morning. We welcome you here to Grace United Methodist Church. I hope that you have felt welcome coming into this place of worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. Um, we are glad that you are here. Hope you received an order of worship on your way in. A few things I would like to point out to you this morning um, inside your order of worship is today is the very first Sunday of Advent. Advent is a season of preparation in the life of the church. We look forward to, the, uh, to celebrating again the birth of Christ. And we also are reminded that Jesus not only came some 2,000 years ago, but Jesus comes to us every day through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so season of Advent is a time of preparing ourselves um, for Christ coming to us every day. Um, also, I want you to know that uh, immediately following church, finance and council will be meeting in the conference room for one brief moment. Um, so just if you're a part of finance and council, please keep that in mind. Um, and next Sunday, SPPRC will be meeting, and uh, immediately after worship, a very should be a brief meeting, hopefully, um, but they'll be meeting next Sunday. And uh, also next Sunday at 9.30, we'll be having a pancake breakfast for children and parents. So we invite children and parents to come together and, and to have a, a time of fellowship and a meal of a pancake breakfast. Then we'll transition into our uh, children's hour of worship next Sunday morning. And um, it seems like Thanksgiving just finished up and the Haven of Rest um, had, had their traditional preparing and delivering of, uh, of food. Um, over 500 people just in this area, right Rayford? And, um, but coming up is Christmas. Christmas is right around the corner. And... This year, instead of being Christmas morning, it's going to be on Friday, December the 22nd. And um, Rayford also mentioned that if you'd like to donate ham or finances to help purchase a ham, um, please see Rayford or June Prince, and they can get you set up with that. So keep that in mind. The, uh, the, the preparing of the meals and delivering will be Friday, December 22nd. Um, sir? Need help. Ham's helping on the 22nd, right? Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, that's, that's all the announcements that I have for you today. I would invite you to, um, to read inside your order of worship and also to pick up a newsletter on your way out this morning. We welcome you here. I would invite you to stand with me as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. These words have been passed down from generation to generation in the life of the church. These words remind us the basics, the essentials, the foundation of the Christian faith. Let us join together this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us remain standing this morning.
everybody done? Let us go to the throne of grace for prayer. Father God, we thank you today, Father God, for your Holy Spirit has truly been in this place, Father God, the past few Sundays, Father God. We've been getting a word that's been coming from you, Father God, and we thank you for that word, Father God. We also thank you for our pastor for giving us that word, Father God, that has been given from you to him, Father God. We pray for his family, Father God. We pray for his friends. We pray for the spiritual leaders that you have in this life, Father God, to, to guide him and to lead him, Father God, to, to give us that great word, Father God, that's been coming from you, Father God. We pray for every member in this church, Father God, that you would guide them and lead them as they go out through the rest of this year, Father God, to continue doing your work in this great community, Father God. We thank you for our leaders. We thank you for our teachers that you got here in this great church, Father God, that, that you sent to us, Father God. We pray for the Abbeville High School as well, Father God. We pray for them as they just lost a loved one, Father God, from at school, Father God. And we thank you for our high school coach, Father God, that the football players have won the game, Father God. But we know, Father God, that the coach is leading them and, and guiding them with your word, Father God. That's the most important thing he can do for those young men, Father God. And we thank you for that, Father God. And continue to bless us, Father God, and continue to lead us and guide us as we go out through this service, Father God. We pray for our prayer team as well, Father God, and, and lead them and guide them as well. We pray for our praise team, Father God, as they sing songs of Zion to the people, Father God, throughout this holiday season, Father God, as we celebrate your great son that you have sent to us, Father God. And we thank you for Jesus, Father God, and we thank you for sending him to us on high, Father God. And we, we truly pray that prayer that you truly taught us to pray, Father God. Our Father, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Of preparation. We prepare for the way of the coming of the Lord by examining ourselves and dedicating ourselves to holy living. The Advent wreath and the candles are reminders of our relationship with God. The Advent wreath is round, signifying the never-ending love of God. The wreath is green, signifying the everlasting life we have through our confession of faith in Jesus Christ. The four candles of the Advent wreath represent the four Sundays in the season of Advent and the center candle is the Christ candle that we light on Christmas Eve. Today we light the first Advent candle, the prophet's candle of hope. The prophet's candle reminds us of the prophecies of the Old Testament, the promised hope for all, that a Messiah will be born who saved the people from their sins. Let us pray. Loving God, your church joyfully awaits the coming of its Savior. 
who enlightens our hearts and dispels the darkness of ignorance and sin. Pour out your blessings on us as we light the prophet's candle of hope. May this light reflect the hope and splendor of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Stand with me and take a moment and greet those around you. Welcome them to grace.
seated. Let's continue worshiping God with God's tithe and our offering as we have a chance to give back to God a portion of what is God's with God's tithe and to go beyond that tithe and to give an offering. And as we're reminded every week to know that in our giving, our giving matters. It matters because it's our response to God's love for us. It's our response to how God has poured out blessing upon us. It matters because it makes a difference. It makes a difference in the lives of people who hear the good news of Jesus. And in our giving, that's what happens. We enable the ministry and the mission of the church to share the good news of Jesus Christ, the hope of the world. Let us pray. Holy God, your presence is here. God, we thank you. We thank you for meeting us. God, we thank you for not giving up on us. God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, who loves us beyond our imagination and loves us so much that he would die for us, for all people. That's love. God, may we, your people, your church, respond back in love to you. May we give, God, to you your tithe and our offering. And Holy Spirit, may you bless and multiply the giving and the receiving. And Holy Spirit, may, may you go ahead of us, we pray. And prepare the minds and the hearts to hear the message, the good news of Jesus, as we, your church, go out and share it. In your name we pray. In this world that we live in, there's a lot of rushing around. And often I think we don't stop to be still and let the Holy Ghost do what he does best. This song is a beautiful song. It's called Be Still. The words are up on the screen. Um, unfortunately, I didn't write this. I wish I did. Um, but it's, it's a lovely song. It's a gentle song about the Holy Spirit.
be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come bow before him now with reverence and fear in him no sin is found we stand on holy ground be still for the presence of the lord the holy one is here be still for the glory of the lord is shining With holy fire, with splendor, he is crowned. How awesome is the sight! How radiant, King of Light! Be still, for the glory of the Lord is shining all around. Be still, for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. He comes to cleanse and heal, to minister his grace. No work too hard for him, in faith receive from him. Be still, for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. And let us stand together now as we present God's tithes and our offerings. can be seated and children can be dismissed for children's church at this time. It's an honor and a pleasure to read the opening of the Christmas season with the words of Luke 1, 5 through 25. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. He belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. 
He is never to take wine or other fermented drink and will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you the good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. This is the word of God for the people of God. I've been asked to uh, have a fast sermon today. Since the college football selection happens at noon, we got out early last week. There's no promises today. Just, just go ahead and let you know. There's something about stories, telling stories. The other night we went out for Boyd's birthday. He turned 39 last week, and um, as we're sitting around the table eating, we're t- just telling stories. And I made a comment then that night. I said, Boyd can tell a story. He just kind of draws you in. He starts talking, telling a story. You're like, tell me. And even when he's told me a story five times, which he's been known to do. He said, hey, Rev, did I tell you? He's like, yeah, but you can tell me again. Because he could tell a story. And I think back to just this past Thanksgiving. It's a home frying a turkey. I was talking to my mom on the phone. We were just reminiscing. We started telling stories about family and growing up. And there's something about telling a story. But we look around this world, and too many times all we see are stories of weariness, stories of hurt, stories of loss. We read about, hear about people murdered, children and women abused, hatred of another person because of their skin color or their religious belief. Our world is weary. And sadly, we we hear more of those stories than we should. And as I think about Stories and the power of a story. A while back, I was watching ESPN, and they were ESPN had an advertisement of, of something they have called E60. You may have heard of it. E60 is a is a show that comes on and they they, they highlight an athlete or a sports figure. But here's the deal: it comes on on Sunday morning. And the tagline for E60 caught my attention because it said, start your Sunday with a story. And I thought, I do every week. And I began to wonder, how many people start their their Sunday with a story of inspiration from E60? Versus how many hear the transforming story of Jesus? See, church, we got a weary world. We have a a, a weary world, try saying that five times fast, a weary world 
that is in need of hope. A world that is hurting. And we, the church, have a story to tell. We have a story to tell. And if we, the church, don't tell the story, in fact, the Scripture says, if we don't tell them, who's going to tell them? We have a story to tell. Throughout the season of Advent, we're going to be in a sermon series, The Thrill of Hope, A Weary World Rejoices. You may recognize that line. It's from a famous Christmas song, A Holy Night. We'll sing it a little later. And so for the next three Sundays after today and then Christmas Eve at our 3 o'clock worship service that afternoon, we're going to be talking about this thrill of hope. We're going to be thinking about and, and reading about some characters in this Christmas story. Today we're going to be talking about Zechariah. And we're going to hear a little bit of Zechariah's hopeful song because Zechariah realized something too some 2,000 years ago. The world is weary and it's in need of hope. And so today we're going to hear about Zechariah's hopeful song. And again, just a reminder, as, as we are in this season of Advent, Advent, again, it's a time of preparation. It's a time of anticipation. Advent is a time of hope. And here's the deal about hope. Let, let's, let's get this set in stone real quick. Hope is not wishful thinking. You hear me? Hope is not wishful thinking. In fact, hope is a certainty of things to come. Hope is a certainty of things to come, just an uncertainty of when or how. And so we have hope in this weary world. We have a thrill of hope, actually, and his name is Jesus. And that's what the season of Advent is about, preparing our minds and hearts to hear again, to celebrate again, to be ready for the coming of Jesus because he is coming. And Advent is a time to admit we've sinned. It's a time for us to look at ourselves and say, you know what, I'm a pretty messed up individual. In fact, I can be pretty bad at some times. In fact, I'm glad not everybody can see my thoughts and know my thoughts because they are bad sometimes. Advent is a time to recognize we are sinners. It's a time for us to ask ourselves the question, am I making a contribution to doing what's right? Like we talked about last Sunday, sometimes we get wrapped up in everything that we shouldn't do, all the things we could do wrong rather than what we could do right. So you heard Don read a few minutes ago. Just kind of recap that story. From Luke 1, the story of, of Zechariah. Let's, let's kind of get, in the terms of this story, let, let, let's get our mind on the characters, all right? you got Zechariah and Elizabeth. They are the picture of Jewish piety and righteousness. Zechariah is a priest. Elizabeth is from a family of priests. They're old and they're childless. And so Luke has introduced the characters of this story. Now Luke begins to tell the story. And Luke tells us that Zechariah's division of priests were on duty that, that day. And Zechariah drew the short straw, so to speak. He was the one that had to go into the holy place to perform the priestly duties. And as he is doing that, the people are attending this hour of prayer. And by the way, I am thankful right now while we're in this place, there's somebody praying for this service because of our prayer team. It's a good model. Maybe they got it out of Luke 1, I don't know. But while Zechariah is going into the holy place, people are praying and, and waiting for him to come out. They're, they're waiting for his reappearance. They're waiting for his blessing. And Zechariah is alone in this holy place, and he's visited by Gabriel. And Gabriel comes to him, and he gives him a message, and the message is fourfold. He says, listen up, man. Elizabeth is going to have a child. You're going to name him John. And this child is going to give you, going to give your wife, and going to give many people great joy and gladness. You, you're going to raise this child in what's, what, what was known as a Nazarite tradition, which means he will, he will not drink any wine or strong drink. And this child will, will minister in the spirit of Elijah. In other words, this child will be moved by the spirit of God. Understandably so, Zechariah has some questions, like most of us would. And because of Zechariah's questions and somewhat of, of a doubt there, Gabriel says, you're going to be speechless. You're going to be mute until all this happens. So Zechariah comes out of the holy place. All the worshipers are outside waiting on this overdue priest. And all Zechariah is able to do is give them a few signs and gestures of what's happened. But did you notice something? They, ex they, they had a sense. <laughs> I mean, not being able to speak would probably be a good sense and reason why. But they had a sense. Zechariah had experienced God. God. 
which makes me think, even when we can't speak, we still have a story to tell. We have a story to tell. Zachariah's duty ends. He goes home. Elizabeth becomes pregnant. She praises God for it. And now they wait. Zechariah is silent. Elizabeth is in hiding for five months. We have this mood of expectation. Do you, do you feel the power of the story? And then I think, I wonder what Zechariah thought every time he went into the holy place after that experience. Because when Zechariah was in that holy place, he was the only one who experienced this miraculous portion of the story. But others experienced the evidence of God's presence. So we have a story to tell. And then I began to think, can people, can people tell when we have been spending time with God? It will be hoped. You see, we see in this story, we see in this story God's doing all this work, and God's doing all this work within the institutions of the faith community. He's not necessarily doing all this work outside the faith community. Maybe that's why God calls the faith community to take the message outside. And just like Luke's gospel tells us and shows us, God works in and through normal avenues of life in the believing community of faith. Did you hear me? God works in normal avenues of life through the believing community of faith. This story reminds us that God had not forgotten promises to his people. This story also shows us that when we exercise our faith, we are then put in a position to be used for God's purposes. Did you hear me? When you exercise your faith, you are then put in position to be used for God's purposes. So that's just the back story. We ain't got to the story I'm going to read. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. We're going to pick up in verse 57. Luke 1, verse 57. And yes, your bulletin is true. 57 through 80. Hang with me. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown its great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, none of your relatives have this name. Then they began motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give them. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue freed, and he began to speak, praising God. Fear came, came over all the neighbors, and all, and all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. And all who heard them pondered them and said, What then will this child become? For indeed the hand of the Lord was with him. Let's hear Zechariah's hopeful song. Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of the servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by, by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us. You hear that? By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child grew and became strong in spirit. He was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. That's a powerful story. Luke's gospel is very clear. 
the conviction that Jesus is the Messiah and that John the baptizer, that's not his last name, by the way. You know it's not John, first name, Baptist, last, that's not it. And maybe he was the first Baptist, I don't know. But it's John the baptizer. So Luke's, Luke, Luke's convinced. Jesus is the Messiah, and John came in the spirit and the power of Elijah to, to prepare the way for Jesus. To prepare the way. I wonder how we oftentimes prepare the way for Jesus. Because we have a story to tell. And then Luke makes it clear that with, with Elizabeth and Zechariah, their views, it's, it's not just something they've come up with. This is all about the work of the Holy Spirit. It's all been inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is all what God is doing for God's people and through God's people. And we read where the time came for Elizabeth to have this boy, to give birth to John. She has John, and as is the ritual and tradition, family and friends arrive to celebrate and to be a part of this special occasion. And in addition to celebrating, it's time to name the child. And it was tradition for, for family and friends to be there for that, and it's tradition for the, the child to typically, especially a boy, to be named after his father, especially if it's a firstborn son. And they assume, are you going to name him Zachariah? And they said, no, we're going to call him John. And they said, what? I don't mean by your family named John. They look at Zechariah, and, and Zechariah is motioning because, remember, he still can't speak. And he would get something to write down on, and he says, his name's going to be John. And as soon as he does that, everybody's amazed, and he begins to speak. And Zechariah begins to praise God. And did you hear what he praised God for? He didn't praise God for John. He praised God for Jesus, whom John was going to prepare the way for. He praised God for God's faithfulness to God's people. He praised God for, for God raising up salvation for people. Zechariah breaks out into prophecy, and this was originally viewed as a hymn. And again, the hymn is a focus on Jesus. But John refer, uh, Zechariah references John and says, but you're going to be the one who's going to go before the Lord. You, you're going to prepare the way. And then going before Jesus, Zechariah said, John, you, you're going to give knowledge of salvation to these people. John, you, you, you're going to proclaim a forgiveness of sin. And it's all because of the mercy of God. God, you are awesome. And we have a story to tell. See, Zechariah had a song of hope for this weary world. And it was a story of salvation. It was a story of God giving us exactly what we need. And that's hope. Giving us what we need not what we deserve. That's what God did for all people through his son Jesus. And we have a story to tell. So we left off with verse 80. And Luke kind of draws this story to a close and prepares to move to a next one. But Luke lets us know that this child grew. This child became strong in spirit. And then this child spent some time in the wilderness before he made his ministry public, which got me to thinking, church. Back in the Old Testament, God's people spent some time in the wilderness before they experienced what God had for them. Even Jesus spent a little time in the wilderness before he did what God had brought him to do. It got me to thinking. It's kind of funny how people in the scriptures when they have something big coming up they spend a little time in the wilderness in grace we've been in the wilderness but I think the Lord's got something big for us the Holy Spirit's real in this place we got a story to tell Get off script for just a little bit. Every church I've ever talked to says, I want to grow. Can I tell you what brings growth? Can I? Okay, all right. It's not programs, it's not even money. 
as Miss June and I have said before, you know, God, in this conversation we've had, God didn't call us to have a balanced budget. They're, they're nice. <laughs> Give me, they're nice. But God called us to make disciples. And so church growth doesn't happen because of better programs, better facilities, more money. Let me tell you what brings growth in a church. The power of the Holy Spirit sharing the gospel message of Jesus. That's what brings growth in the church. And not just, when I say growth, I don't mean more rear ends and seats. I mean growth in relationship with God and one another. That's what we saw in the early church. And that's what we need today. And so, Grace, we've been in a wilderness. But I believe God's got something big for us. Because His Holy Spirit is here and alive in this place. And we have a story to tell. Just a reminder of how important that story is. The story of salvation, by the way. The story of hope, by the way. Y'all familiar with the, the comic illusionist group, Penn and Teller? Y'all familiar with them? Penn. Penn is an avowed and vocal atheist. One time, Penn was evangelized by a Christian man. Penn did not change his views, but here's what he said about that experience. Listen close. I've always said, you know, that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. Proselytize is a fancy word for telling them about Jesus. Witnessing. He said, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe there's a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell, or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it really socially awkward. He said, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, and that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I'll tackle you. This is more important than that. It's pretty solid words. I'm not suggesting you go tackle somebody unless the truck is bearing down on them. But what I do suggest is we have a serious message to tell. And oftentimes we don't carry it out these doors. We just leave it here. We have a story to tell. See, Advent is a time of preparation. It's a time of anticipation. It's a time for hope. And again, hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is certainty of what's to come. A while back, Susan, y'all know Susan Sarandon, actress? Okay, some of y'all younger folks be like, nah, I don't know who that is. She's been around a while. But anyway, a while back, Susan Sarandon had a quote. And this is not be political from my standpoint. It was from her, but just hang with me. Her quote was this. If Hillary Clinton would have been elected president, we would already have been at war. Do you know what I say about that? Dear Susan. We've been at war. We've been at war since the fall of humanity. And dear Susan, our war has nothing to do with political leader. It has everything to do with our sinful nature. And talk about a weary world. A world when we wonder what's next. What's going to happen next? A world where we turn on the news and you hear about nuclear missiles. A world where people are murdered in places of worship. A weary world where people, children and adults, are shot down at a concert. 
a weary world. Women and children are abused, sold as sex slaves. A weary world where things are just stolen and taken from you. A weary world when a three-year-old girl is put to bed one night. Mama gets up the next morning and can't find her. Come to find out the mama's boyfriend has something to do with it. The child is most likely dead. A weary world. Church, we got, we got the hope to tell. We have a story to tell. Because the thrill of hope is Jesus Christ. And if a weary world is ever going to rejoice, they've got to know about Jesus Christ. And if a weary world is ever going to hear about Jesus Christ, it takes the church to do it. We have a story to tell. And that story that God so loved the world. God so loved this God-hating world is really what that says in the original language. God so loved this God-hating world that he sent his only son. That whoever, no matter who you are, whoever believes in him would have everlasting life. Would not perish. Whoever. That's a story of hope. That the mess you see, the world in which you live, is not the best there is. Praise be to God. The best is yet to come. But we remember that story. Jesus sitting with his disciples. Jesus taking bread and lifting it up to God, giving thanks to God. Breaking the bread. Giving it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. When the meal was over, he took the cup. He lifted it up to God. He gave thanks to God. He gave it to his disciples. He said, take a drink. This is my blood given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this often. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. So today, we come to this table in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ and his mighty acts of salvation. And not only do we come in remembrance, we come believing and knowing that through the work of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit makes this bread and this wine be for us the body and the blood of Christ. Because in some mysterious way, God blesses these elements. And in some mysterious way, God meets us at this table through the work of his spirit, and we find grace anew at the meal. See, there's something special about this meal. So special that when you look to the end of the book of Luke, you find that people on their way to Emmaus, their eyes were opened because they shared a meal with Jesus. My prayer today is that, God, you would open our eyes as we share this meal. Meet us here. Holy Spirit, we do pray you make this bread and this wine be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we, your church, may be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. It's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. A word of invitation, a word of instruction. The invitation is that you're invited here. You don't, you're here. Jesus says, come. No matter who you are, come. A word of instruction is there will be serving stations at each section of chairs. If you come with open hands, bread will be placed into your hand. 
take the bread, dip it into the cup, and into your mouth. And know this altar is open for prayer. If my servers would please come at this time.
more time. Fall on your knees. church but there's a thrill of hope and his name is Jesus we have a story to tell let us go sharing the good news telling the story of hope through God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit Amen let us join hands together